hello everyone. Thank you for inviting me. I am Ellie. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> I don't know. Well, okay, let me present them. myself. No? Okay, about myself. Uh, just, uh, um, okay, I'm from Greece, but uh, I studied in Greece at the university. I came in Barcelona. I did my PhD here in UPC. And then I spent some time working in academia. Then I switched to industry. And now I'm again in academia in BSc, which stands for Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And I'm a senior researcher there in a group that, where we work on edge computing. So these are the contents of the presentation. Uh, given the time restrictions, I'm not sure where we arrive. So let's see on the fly. So I will talk a bit about edge computing. I don't really know your background. I know the project is called Green Edge. Okay, not yours. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if you are familiar with Mac and the standardization. So I will give a bit of introduction about edge computing and how it emerged from cloud computing. Uh, then we'll see how some examples on how uh, edge computing has been adopted in European projects. And then we'll talk a bit about the Mac reference architecture. So if it is of interest to you. And then I had some examples from the work we are doing in, in my center uh, about distributed computing, but uh, I don't know if we'll have time. So let's see. Okay, so quick, uh, what is edge computing? I guess, I guess you know by now that uh, the main idea behind edge computing is to bring the computation clo closer to where the data is. But why do we do it? for latency only, or there are other reasons that motivate the use of edge computing. How is it implemented and where is it located in the end? Because, okay, edge is a very broad aspect. So this is what we'll try to answer in this talk. So let's take a step back and think a bit about cloud computing. That is the, a, a very relevant paradigm that came before edge computing. So what is cloud computing? Well, it is having the computation to some remote location that is the cloud, where usually we have a lot of resources, a lot of computational power. So what are the advantages of cloud computing and why it was so popular and it is still so popular? The, the main reason is that you have a lot of computing power and storage. You have ubiquitous access, meaning that as long as you're connected to the internet, you can access your cloud resources. It is very scalable because if you want more resources, you just buy more resources and use more resources. And uh, it is very cost effective because you don't need to own the infrastructure. You don't need to maintain the infrastructure. You just use the resources that someone else maintains for you. So how, what, how are these cloud services? How do they look like? There are different models for the cloud services. So first you have on-premise cloud. And in this case, you just go and have the full stack of hardware and software in your own premises. So there you have to do all the work. You put the servers, the hardware, virtualization infrastructure, operating system, application, everything. So this makes sense maybe if you are a factory, maybe if you are in a university, they want to have the full control of all the cloud infrastructure. But now the, the main business model are when the cloud providers maintain some part of the infrastructure and offer you the services. So a very well-known paradigm is the infrastructure as a service. So what happens in this case? The cloud provider uh, maintains all the hardware, the storage, um, everything, and offers you a virtualization environment. So in the end, to, uh, you are, uh, as a user, you go there, pay for the services you want, and you install your own virtual machines. And in these virtual machines, you put whatever you like. So this makes a lot of sense if you are a small company, an SME, if you want to have virtual machines somewhere without maintaining all the all the hardware. Another very well-known model is the platform as a service. I don't know if you are aware on these terms, but platform, platform, uh, platform as a service means that the cloud provider puts together all the hardware, the virtualization environment, the operating system, and offer you access to a runtime environment. What does this mean? That, okay, you as a user, you want to deploy your machine learning application, you want to use TensorFlow and whatever. So you just access this cloud platform and you can directly start programming because you have all the, the, nef the necessary libraries and system that you just can run your application. So if you are a software developer, maybe you are more interested in this type of model. 
Then you have software as a service. Okay, in short, for example, Office, Microsoft Teams, um, Slack, Skype, all these are software as a service. You use software that is hosted on the cloud. So this is this makes sense when you want to use a specific software. Mm -hmm. And then if you see here in between, there are some gaps because we have other models. You have storage as a service, for example, Dropbox, where you put your files. You have database as a service where you can have a database located on the cloud and your programs or your applications can use this database when you have you don't have to maintain it locally. And you also have function of functions as a service. So I don't know if you are familiar with the serverless programming model. So this is a, a somewhat more recent concept where if you have big data and a lot of data to compute and you have to you want to make some specific functions that are the same for all the data. For example, I don't know, have a lot of data, you want to do a specific transformation or specific processing, you can um, use this function as a service where you have a specific function, a specific uh, yes, method that you want to apply to all this data. So this can run in, a par in parallel in the cloud. So you, you, you break all the big data in smaller chunks and you launch a, a lot of parallel uh, services that do this transformation. So this is function as a service. So we have all these different cloud services and we also have different cloud environments. For example, we have public cloud, we have Amazon, IBM, etc. You have private cloud if you have it in your own premises. And of course there are differences because if it's public cloud, you have the scalability and less costs. If it's private, you have the security and the full control. But then you can have also multi-tenancy because for your specific solution, you may need, you may want to use multiple cloud providers. Uh, so you may use uh, more than one public cloud providers. Or then you may have an hybrid cloud where you use public cloud and private cloud. And then you can have a combination of everything. So these are the different types of cloud computing services that you could use. So cloud, uh, well, has many uses, but it was very much uh, driven by the emergence of Internet of Things. And why is that? Because we had a lot of IoT data. So the model was that we upload everything in the cloud and then we generated knowledge because what we are interested in is knowledge. We don't care what the sensors read. We care about the outcome that maybe have some actionable outcomes. And then we had some specific, we had novel services, for example, we had specific application in our smartphone or in our home that um, exploited all this valuable knowledge. And this were working very well with the cloud computing. So why do we need edge computing? Because the data kept growing. So we have, okay, we don't have time. So we have all these numbers that every time you search a market search, they change. But we have a lot of data, a lot of connected devices, 5G, connected users, etc. And also the model in which we use the data has been changing because be before we had like the data produced by the sensors, they go to the cloud and then you consume the information somewhere else. But now the, end, the, the, the ones that generate data may often consume, you, consume them because sometimes you have your smartphone, it generates a lot of data but then you also want the knowledge back. So maybe it, does make, it makes more sense to have the computation close to where your smartphone is and not have to upload it in the cloud and then download it again. So then we have all these trends, we have big data, a lot of analytics, uh, IoT. So in the end, the path leads to, to edge computing. So what are the key problems that we have massive an amount of connected devices Many times these devices are uh, geographically dispersed. For example, you have a smart city, you have a lot of sensors geographically dispersed uh, throughout the city. It's not in one place. And a, a huge volume of raw data. And then you have problems such as bandwidth limitations because if you need to upload all this huge amount of data to the cloud, you need huge bandwidth in the access, the front hole, the back hole. And then this is uh, very not efficient in terms of energy consumption have latency constraints, if you have real-time services, privacy, et cetera. So edge computing can address these challenges because it offers low latency because the computation stays near to the data. It is more energy efficient. 
it has enhanced security and privacy because at least the data stays there and doesn't have to go to the cloud. And it has sometimes it can offer context awareness and localization because it's closer to the data sources. You can have local solutions and it can enable intelligence and, and uh, more complex applications. So another thing I wanted to mention is that there are many terms that are very similar. You have edge computing, you have fog, you have Mac. So what are all these different terms? So in the end, there are different solutions that were given when this problem emerged. So there were different technical solutions that came from different sites, but they keep converging now. So for example, fog computing emerged by Cisco around 2012. And the main concept was that it was a very heterogeneous network, uh, computing infrastructure that had a lot of heterogeneous devices from routers, computers, uh, access points, gateways, etc. Then we have cloudlets that emerged one year later at uh, Carnegie Mellon. And cloudlets are more a three-tier hierarchy where you have the, the end users, the cloud, and in between you have a small data center. And this small data center is called a cloudlet. And then we have map computing that comes from Etsy, that is the standardization body. And um, it is more, it is not part of the telecom network Mac, but the idea is that it's, it's a net computing solution that is integrated with a telecommunication network. So it's closer to the run. So, okay, there are different terms, but in the end, they, they start converging. Okay, here, the say that some, uh, uh, the Mac, for example, is more regular because it's more standardized the architecture. Fog is more heterogeneous. And, uh, okay, I, I'm going very fast because we're out of time, but if, if there is anything you want to say or comment, please let me know. So here, I won't go into detail to this, but there is a very interesting talk that I guess you, you will get the slides later. You can check in YouTube that uh, they presented some different uh, edge, edge uh, platforms actual software to implement edge computing. And they were commenting and they tried to, to find the best solution for every case. So what they did is that they thought of different use case applications, for example, smart city, autonomous driving, e-health, etc. And they tried to, to determine the basic use case feature, what its use case required. For example, did it require extra bandwidth? It has a lot of latency constraints for real-time services. You need context awareness, etc. So you make this list of requirements for each use case, and then you map each requirement with more technical characteristics. For example, uh, the access medium, if you want an extensible and ubiquitous connectivity with many users, uh, the access medium is important. Uh, you need a lot of computation power if you need real-time services, et cetera. So you make this list, and then uh, the outcome is that they propose the more suitable technologies for its different case. So for example, uh, a smart city that is a very distributed environment could benefit more from fog computing or Mac, whereas uh, content uh, video casting, for example, could also use a cloud that is like a data center. So these are not like the solutions that you need to learn, but what you need to take away from this is that there is not a single solution for every problem. So different scenarios and different use cases and different requirements may need a different technical approach. So uh, another term I would like to mention, another hot keyword in the world of computing is the compute continuum. So I don't know if you have heard this term. Uh, when I was in, all the time I was, I was working in more the telecommunication domain, I've never heard this, this word, compute continuum. But then when I joined BSC, it was like the keyword. Everything has the compute continuum in it. So compute continuum is a fancy word that means all the computational resources that you have from the end device up to the cloud. So everything that is in between and everything where you can perform computation can form this compute continuum. And what the target is at some point is to have services, applications, etc., that can potentially run anywhere across this compute continuum. So you have like a service, at this point it can run in your device, but maybe uh, in another moment it can run at the cloud or, so you can have this intelligent orchestration of services that can happen anywhere across this continuum. And you should see this as a continuum of resources, a pool of resources that are available. 
So, okay. so uh, finishing this introduction, uh, I would like to mention that, okay, on one hand, we have all this paradigm of edge computing and Mac, et cetera, that can offer, um, it's very suitable for real-time services and low latency and energy efficiency. And on the other hand, we have the telecommunication world. We have 5G and beyond that offer all the advantages of ubiquitous connectivity, latency, latency, uh, also latency, uh, well, all the advantages that are offered by 5G. So the real value is in the synergy between these two uh, technologies. So this can really bring forth the, 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 the disruptive services that we are expecting from the future, so combining these two worlds. So I finish the first part in the record time. So any questions or comments? So now the next exercise, uh, when I was preparing this talk, I was, I, I thought, okay, I will see what the most 5G projects are using regarding edge computing. So there was a what paper, okay, it's a, like 2021, but it's still very relevant that uh, took most phase, phase two and phase three projects of 5GPP that are the most um, relevant um, research project in Horizon Europe, okay, Horizon 2020 at that moment, and overviewed the edge computing approaches that were implemented in this project. And maybe you are involved in some of them. So it was a very interesting exercise because you can see all that, some, you can get some insights on the trends that are used in research. So we will try to answer three uh, basic questions. First, where this edge is located? What are the enabling technologies? And what type of functions are executed at the edge? <coughs> okay, so I encourage you to go and look the paper, the white paper in more detail, but here we have some, the highlights of this. So first of all, where uh, is edge computing located? Well, by definition, it's anywhere between the devices and the cloud. But what is the most typical situation? Well, there isn't one. There isn't one because if you see this this pie here, you can see that like 23% were using a private data center. 23% uh, again uh, and on-premise installations. But then you also have close to the run. You have at the street level at the micro data center. So you have different solutions, and mainly the ones that go. Uh, on a more private solution are mainly the projects that are involved in industry 4.0 uh, use cases. Whereas the one that use more distributed solutions at street cabinets, et cetera, are more relevant to smart city use cases. So you see that there are many approaches for that. And then about the implementation. Okay, uh, MEC is the standard that is mostly used in the telecom world. So I was expecting that the majority of projects would use MEC uh, compliant solutions, but this was not the case. 33% of, of the projects used MEC compliant solutions, but then 15% used for computing. That for computing is a very general term. It's anything that you may have. 11% used cord-like architecture. So cord is more uh, similar to the cloud-led solution. And then you had like 41% other. So you see that it's not very, it's not one direction. It's a lot of different approaches. So, okay, these are the different implementation. So let's go and see what is each one of them. So the FOC computing, there is an open FOC reference architecture that is relatively broad, so it's not very standardized as, as the MEC standard. But the main concept is you have, you have this heterogeneous network of computing nodes in between the device and uh, the cloud. And the main idea is that you may have different levels of computation and each level has a different function. So you, 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 in, in the lowest level, you have a huge amount of raw data and then you start aggregate them and processing them and filtering them. And as you go upwards, you generate knowledge. And as you generate knowledge, you also reduce the amount of data that need to be transmitted. So the, the objective is that at the end, towards the cloud, you have less data, but more knowledge. And there is a reference architecture that is very broad. So it has like uh, some layers that are the services and the application. 
you have the virtualization layer, you have the hardware in the end, and then you have some concepts that are transversal. So you have uh, security, management, the data analytics, and all that. So it's it's a very, I, I will not go into detail, but it is like some guidelines how to, to organize your software stack. Then uh, regarding the code-like architecture, again, I will not go into detail. I'm not even an expert in this, but the idea is to use a lot of commodity. Think of it as an architecture, mainly thought like a small data center. So you have a lot of computing resources that are um, commodity hardware, not specific. They are just servers, for example, and that you use them to, to, to implement a lot of services. So then uh, this takes advantage of virtualization and SDN. So you have uh, an orchestrator, that is, they call it XOS. You have the ONOS that uh, handles the SDN layer. And then you use, um, you have all the computational layer that is, they call it like links here, to, to deploy your function as you wish. So this is an example, the, a specific architecture used for mobile aids. So you have a lot of computational nodes and then you can have this part for BB use for the run. Uh, this is like the core. This is the management stack. And this you have like a dedicated part that is for the edge, but it uses the same pool of resources and it is orchestrated by the management plane. So I, I only saw this to say that there are a lot of projects that use this approach because it makes sense for their specific use cases. And then of course we have the Mac architecture that I will explain in more detail next. So this was a very nice plot because it had like different technologies that were used in each project. This is the number of projects that adopted this technology. And again, you see that there is not one solution. Everything is very heterogeneous. So a couple of projects used GPUs because probably they had uh, AR or VR or required some analytics that needed GPUs. Others didn't. Then you have, uh, okay, uh, the orchestration. Again, you have different platforms. You have OSM. I, probably you know OSM. Or, okay, it's the most well known. Again, in the Etsy universe, it's the well known orchestrator. But there are different solutions, other technologies, and then other that are probably vendor specific. You have different solutions for the end, um, SDN and different virtualization environments and container orchestrators. So a lot of technologies and a lot of combinations. And then the final question were, what kind of what kind of functions do we execute at the edge? So the, the highest the percentage was network functions. So you know now that 5G is virtualized, so you have different functions for the different parts of the network. So some of these functions can be executed at the edge. What kind of functions? Mainly correlated functions. EPC, that's not very 5G, but okay, still EPC is used, or specific function, function from the 5G core network, and especially the UPF, because the UPF, as we'll see later, is the one that handles the data. So you want to have this data plane close to the edge in order to intercept the data and do the processing at the edge and other functions. But again, a smaller percentage, but still a considerable one, is a deployment of application of application related functions at the edge because you have, uh, for example, a, a VR renderer or I don't know, a caching server or something related to your application that you want to execute it close to the users. So you also have application related uh, VNFs. And the trick would be to be able to orchestrate everything um, jointly. So I think that's the second part. Um, <laughs> um, so any questions? Or... So now we can go more in deep about the MEC standard. So I don't know if you have, uh, are you working with this? Are you interested in this? Or well, you'll be interested because <laughs> I will explain. I, I will send you the questionnaire. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So the ETC standard is a standard that uh, wants to regulate a bit the design of, uh, of edge solutions. 
So it is an open standard, anyone can have access to it. It is access agnostic, meaning that it's not designed specifically for 4G or 5G. You can have any underlying communication network. And uh, it targets a wide ecosystem of uh, verticals. It can be a lot of these cases. So it is fully aligned with the NAV framework because both are Etsy. So you have a full support of virtualization. And we'll see later how these two different architectures are connected. It is trying to, it is becoming aligned with 3GPP. So there are several working groups that jointly consider how MEC will be implemented with 5G because 5G per se does not, um, MEC is not a part of 5G, but it's trying to become. So they're trying to, to bring both the both words together. Uh, it is, uh, um, there is support for federation coming from GSMA because they try to have a common platform to expose services to the, uh, the end users, the developers. So there are a lot of efforts for MEC federation, how different MECs from different vendors talk together. And there is uh, a lot of efforts for MEC for automotive. So there is a working group that targets specifically automotive applications. So let's go more deeper into the MEC reference architecture. So probably you have seen this architecture. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so this is the, the reference architecture offered by MEC. This is not the latest version because recently I just realized it these days that I was looking for the talk. They have a, a newer version that has like a, an entity for federation, but we won't go into this. It has like two, three different blocks there about federation. So what is this? Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's start from one part of this architecture, the host. So all this block is the host. What is the host? Think of it that like you have a server at the edge. So this is one host. So you, you will deploy one Mac in this host. And if you had different servers in different parts of the smart city, you could have multiple hosts. So what goes into the host? First of all, the application. So think that you have a, an application, I don't know, like, uh, a uh, smart uh, sightseeing application that you are in the city and you just receive news about the monuments that are very close to where you are located. So let's say that this is an edge service. So this edge service, the developers will program it and put it in a container or a virtual box because now containers are key. So you have Docker containers about everything. So you have this application in a specific container. This container runs at the edge server, at the host. So it's this box is here. These are the different applications that are running there. And of course, they run on top of, of on, on top of a virtualized infrastructure because you have your Docker environment where you have all the containers. So this run, this is this. So on top of it, you run the different services. And this is managed by the virtualization infrastructure manager. So it's Kubernetes or open source, the technologies that manage this containerized infrastructure because when you want to la launch a container, you have to say, I need mm, so many cores, I need GPUs, I need so many, so much memory, etc." So this will create, will get the resources from the infrastructure and allocate it to this container. So this is uh, how this service would be working. But then there are other boxes here. Ah. Okay, and this is the data plane. This is where you get the data from the users. For example, uh, if the user has a, generates a call that says, okay, I want to receive the site scene, or if you want to send the data, this is where you you get the data. So this interfaces with a with communication network. Yeah, this is where you get the interaction, the actual data. So then we have another box within the host that is the Mac platform. So if you remember before when we said the cloud computing paradigm and the platform that offers you the environment to make your application. So this, it, this is a piece of software that facilitates uh, the access to the to the to the edge computing resources. So there, first of all, you have this service registry and the Mac services. So what is this service registry? It's like a catalog where all the services that are running there is is advertised because. If you want to access to this site sync application, how do you know that this is executed in the edge? There is a catalog that says, okay, in this edge, we have these services. So when you connect, 
somehow, somewhere, you know, the, the connection to this application must check if there is this service running here and connect to the edge. Otherwise, it will go to the cloud, to a central. But the next app is in this. Hmm? Isn't the mobile edge computing apps started for each? I mean, there are virtual machines for each of the users. So no. No, it's a service. It's not to a virtual machine for each of the users. So you have this this side sync application, mm -hmm. and you are from your mobile. You you launch it. So this application will will send a call to connect to the server of this software. That okay. so a service can have multiple users because we can both access the same service, but we can be in different locations. So we access this service, and if the service Ideally, um, if if we didn't have any any edge, you have probably as a developer you have um, a central position of the cloud where your application will connect to the server of the cloud and get the site sync information. But if it finds this application available through the service registry in the edge, the traffic is re redirected to the server here, so you get the service from the edge. So, so the user cannot run custom application. <laughs> Uh, I will we'll get about that because you have these boxes and all. but but generally you have someone is I mean you as a user you cannot do whatever you like in the, in the edge because it's not yours so as you, either as a developer you list you you talk with the one that operates this edge computing that is either I don't know uh, and an edge provider or the telecom operator, whatever the business model is, and you can maybe launch your application there, but you cannot run whatever you like. Yeah. Yeah. In principle, there might be a service running at the edge, right, that offers other services to the users the possibility of using some virtual machine on that edge device, right? Yes, but so, the device yeah. cloud. At the it edge. has to go for. We, I will. I will discuss it a bit. I, okay. I'm not a major expert in this, but the, the boxes that are on top. So we'll go after. So because this is what we assume now. <laughs> okay, that, right. we assume many things. <laughs> of course, this is also a standard. And then you to find solutions that uh, take into account the standard. It's another option. Sure. Another. But okay. Uh, and then. Uh, you also you may also have Mac services that are a bit services that are offered by the Mac platform. So, for example, uh, if if it is uh, integrated with a telecom network, you can have from the telecom network uh, the signal strength of the various users and extrapolate the location of the users. So this can be a service that is offered by the Mac itself. So it's one of these. Okay. Mac service. Let's not Central one. This one. This one. Okay, so this may, for example, maybe a service that interacts with 5G or whatever and determines the location of the connected users. And maybe your site sync application that you developed yourself interacts with this and gets the, the location from the user because if you are a developer, maybe you're not an expert in triangulating 5G signals and strength to, to derive the location. So maybe someone else. The platform, the Mac platform, gives the service to you, and you get the information from there. So that is why there, are, there is this interface. So this, you can exploit services offered by the Mac platform. And also, all these lines are interfaces. So these MPR uh, Mac platform interfaces. You see, you have MM that are management interfaces. And these are external. So, so these are the different type of services that may run in. So, so, so these are from the platform itself, and these are other applications that you can have. And then there are two more boxes. One is the traffic control rules because you can have like prior prioritization of traffic, and then you have this DNS handling. So this DNS handling is when you access. In the example before, we try to access the site sync application. So where is this call? You are in your 5G network, so you connect to the, the sightseeing web. Where do you go? To the cloud or to the edge? Well, if, if it is available in the edge, you have this DNS handling that will redirect your call and put it to the edge. So there are some certain rules that manage the traffic. Okay, so all this is in a host, in one server. If you have multiple hosts, you will have this in different hosts. Maybe you have different services. 
And then you have the management plane. So the management plane, you have management at the host level, and then you have like more global management. So that the global thing is that you can manage multiple host sites. So at the host level, you have the MEC platform manager. So this was the MEC pla platform, and it is managed by this. So what are these boxes? And then again, you have the multi. Oh, I don't have more. Okay. Okay. So what are these these different boxes? And I did something wrong with the animation. Anyway, so the three boxes. The mid one is easy because are all the, the rules about the filtering and the, the DNA. So this here, you set the rules that are implemented here. These are services running that do what you want, but this is where you set them up. And this, the, the, the element manager makes sure makes sure that all the services run here are operating correctly. They do what they should. And then you have this box here that is important, that is the MEC uh, app lifecycle manager. So what does it mean, lifecycle management of the services? It means that it is responsible to set them up, to start them, their operation, to terminate them. So in the example before, if you are the developer of this sightseeing app, the first time it is uh, launched at the edge, you want this uh, lifecycle manager to talk to the Vim and say, I want to launch a container with these resources. So this will say, okay, start me uh, this container. This will get the resources and the, the application will start. If it crashes, you, you'll get a report from the Vim that the application has crashed, we need to relaunch it, etc. So all this is the lifecycle management of the service. And it is done there within the platform. But then, yeah. Is there any model that um, monitors the usage of the resources that were required by one of these services to see whether or not the service does use all the resources that were allocated? I don't know. I think I think between this they will do it because the, this is the open open stack and uh, Visual Open Stack and OSM have this functionality. So I I think they have like a monitoring. But this is implementation then. This is like the standard, the, the model, and then you have the actual technologies that do that. Sure. Um, and then you have, at the higher level, you have the multi-access orchestrator because the orchestrator, for example, if you monitor this information, mm. you may determine to, you may decide that, okay, this is very loaded or I have resources left. And so you have the, the multi-access uh, edge orchestrator that is like an upper level. So it does something similar to this, but at a higher level. So, uh, and an important thing is that you see that these interfaces with this operator, operation support system. So if you are a developer and you, you make your own application about the sightseeing, how do you launch it at the edge? Well, if the edge is part of, uh, I don't know, a telecom operator, you have to enter from here. This is like a portal of the, the functions that are available to the operator or even from your device, because this is like the possibility from a device to launch a service at the mic. So there is this interface here. So from a device, you can say, ah, the, uh, I want this, uh, I want the site sync information to be launched to the edge that is closest to me. But of course, to do this, you pass from the orchestrator. So the orchestrator will check with the operation support system to see if you have paid. I mean, you cannot install anything at the edge. You have, there is a business model. So maybe if you get granted access, you pass from the OSS and then the orchestrator will get your code, your container, whatever, the piece of software that forms your application will check its integrity, if everything is okay, if it's um, secure, whatever aspects. And if everything is okay, then it will and it will select the most appropriate edge, if there are many, so you could have you say, okay, I will install this in this edge at this part of the city or a different one. And then it will pass the command here to this app, uh, application lifecycle manager. So then at the local level, the application will be launched. So it's like a higher level of orchestration. Yes. So 
every anywhere you like they can run you don't care where they run but this the most probable thing is this will be collocated with a host because this is a host level so if you have a server that runs on the software this is at the same place this yeah, is why so this is at the host level you have the server so part of the computation is dedicated to this but then you also have another piece of software that is the management so it's like pieces of software that are interrelated i think that next one we'll see the relations of this with the virtualization infrastructure maybe it will become clearer but yes these are like different soft pieces of software you keep installing different software packages that are interrelated so all this we install open stack and then you install I don't know. I don't know if you use any specific edge platform, your project, know, light edge or whatever a platform for edge, and you install all the packages that are there. So maybe you have they're implemented in one single software or different. So it's, it's a really an implementation. But this one here is usually an upper level. So this may be a central place. I don't know. Depends on how your edge is conceived. So maybe you have like multiple edge sites and then you have like a more central entity that generate that handles all these edge sites. So this is where the central orchestration would be because it controls everything, but maybe it could be installed in one of the edges as well, but contact all of them. So this is an implementation question. So, but, but this, the, the, the orchestrator handles, can handle multiple edge sites. Whereas this will handle only this, only the, the platform will have its, its own manager. <coughs> uh, any other questions or comments? So this is just, it's not implemented, it's a standard. Then you have actual software platforms that do this or try to do this or part of this. So the implementation is a different issue. Uh, so these are some, uh, others, so for example, here for Vim, you usually use OpenStack or Kubernetes. You have different platforms that are available. And I think if you go to, to this, uh, the Mac site, the Etsy Mac site, it has some open projects that are compatible with the Mac solution. So all these, for example, all these different types of product, um, software platforms implement this Mac platform in a different way. Uh, then for the manager, you have different solutions. For orchestrator, you have other solutions. So there are a multitude of, a multitude of solutions. Yes. Uh, that's <laughs> oh, these solutions that I put here that come from this site are compatible with the Mac architecture. So they should be able to be compatible. But yeah. then, as any piece of software to set it up. It's an open issue. So, um, for sure, some of them. Okay, you probably won't use five different platforms. You, you pick one one of them or the more suitable for your experiment, and you you install one solution of this. <laughs> but then the orchestrator level, uh, I will show you some some approaches, some projects. Some use it for GoS, other use different solutions. So you have to make it compatible. So you have to. Decide what you, you will use and then see, modify it and adapt it. But it is one thing is the theory and then the practice is different. <clears throat> so then these, there is a multitude of edge platforms that are not compatible with Mac because they were developed by the, comp by the computing world, Linux foundation and all that. So that's a different story as well. So these are some examples of these solutions that are mostly from Linux Foundation. <laughs> some of them are like infrastructure as a service, but for the edge or platforms, and they use different, this is the orchestration level, so they use different orchestrators. So it's not a straightforward uh, solution. <laughs> so, so it's not going to be possible to use them because we're No, it, it is bad. It is, the thing is that you have the Mac standard that tries to make all the interactions with 5G, but not everything is 5G. I mean, you can have an IoT network that doesn't have nothing to do with 5G or 
So then we, we may have any solution that is very well established as well from the Linux Foundation. But if you want to have the interaction between the UPF and the 5G network and all that, and you need to go into the telecom world, maybe the MEC standard is more relevant. But it's not a straightforward question. And that's why when I, I reviewed the projects in 5GPP, not all, I mean, only 33% used MEC. So it's, it's an open question. It depends very much. The, the conclusion is that it depends on your use case. What you, I mean, for investigation, for research and theoretical work, you can do whatever you like. But for actual implementation, it depends on your use case. What kind of network you have, what kind of sensors, where you want what, what other software components you have. So everything goes if it works. So another question that uh, comes into mind is how is the Mac orchestrated? So, okay, we saw that you have the central orchestrator and then the management of the platform, but what technology do you use to orchestrate the Mac? So if you go here, they have like different software and these are MFV orchestrators. So maybe if you have been seeing about 5G test pets and 5G projects, they also use this type of orchestrators for the 5G network because the network function virtualization orchestrators. And then you have some, some other solutions that are more dedicated to the edge, like this folk of art. So what do you, yes? Are they, when you call them projects, and it's not clear to me if they are already working or not, and if it's already deployed, are like people using this? Yes. Okay. Ah, the, this project here, yeah. uh, this is like software, software solutions from, Linux Foundation, uh, yes, there are pieces of software, they're working, but where, in which application is another question. And all these, these are, the I think 17, or I don't know how many, uh, uh, 5G PPP European projects, most of them now terminated, that use this solution, they use this software and have their demos and pilots, etc. So, So what is the difference between this virtualization infrastructure and the Mac? Because these are virtual, have you never heard of OSM and uh, all that and orchestration of 5G? What is this project? <laughs> <laughs> it's about so. green edge computing technologies. So I'm joking. Um, the future. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I so do you want me to to explain this? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, because okay. I think it's it's nice to have a global feature of this uh, this thing. Okay, so so in five G, like the hot topics are the orchestration of the five G network. So you have uh, you have a lot of virtual functions from the network, and someone must decide where each uh, function runs and the resources used, and then also you. Uh, orchestrate the applications and all that. So there are, um, they, they follow this virtualization uh, standard uh, infrastructure. So here you have, again, the hardware, a virtualization layer as before, and you have a VIM. So this is like very similar as before. So you, you, you have this virtualized infrastructure where you can run virtual machines or containers or whatever is supported. On top, you have different virtual functions. And this EM that are uh, above are the element managers that are, again, virtual functions that check the validity of the virtual network function. So you have a virtual function that is the run, and then you have like a, an element manager that checks if the functions of it is are correct. Anyway, then you have this lifecycle management manager that handles the life cycle of the virtual function, so as we said before. And then you have a global orchestrator. So if you see, it's, it's a bit similar. So this is, for example, this would be the infrastructure, the, the reference model for your whole 5G network. So what is the relation between these boxes and that box? So this is the, the Etsy virtualization infrastructure, and this is the Etsy Mac. So this is a subset of this, because this is more general, and this is a specific application of the overall virtualization infrastructure only for the Edge. 
So you have the Vim, you know this is for sure. So all these are virtual functions, all the services and also the data plane, all that are VNFs. This is also a VNF because in the end, the whole Mac platform is another piece of software. It can be one VNF or many, but it's, it's again a VNF. So it corresponds to that part. These are also VNFs. All the, the DNS rules and the traffic rules, all that are, again, other services that are running there. And then this application life cycle maps with this DVNF manager because this manages all, all these uh, the services there, these VNFs. And then above you have, here you have the NLV orchestrator and there you have the Mac orchestrator. So what happens at that part? So it, this is, we didn't have enough with all these complex boxes. Now they, they merge both boxes together and change the, the arrangement. But this is the same picture of, of the Mac change. But you see here that you have this structure here. You have the Mac orchestrator and the general NFVO orchestrator, and they are connected. So this is the orchestration layer. So you can, I. You could have two different orchestrator, one managing the edge and a different managing your whole virtualized infrastructure, the whole 5G or whatever. But how is this implemented? It's open to interpretation because then, ah, what was that? These are technologies that are used for, for example, for 5G orchestration. OSM, all of different, different solutions that are used in a lot of European projects, etc., to, to orchestrate the 5G. They have different features, and these features are keep changing because now maybe this wasn't supported, but now they may have released a newer version that is supported. So there are different keywords of technologies of pieces of software that are used as orchestrators. But are they also used at the edge, or do you use a different software at the edge? So there are different approaches. You have a global approach where you could have an orchestrator that is an end-to-end -end orchestrator that manages everything. So maybe you have OSM that is for the 5G and the Mac as well. So you have like a joint orchestration of everything, but you could also have multi-tier orchestration. So you could have the global orchestrator for the network, but then have some local orchestrations for the, for the Mac. So let's see example from two, two European projects. I don't know, maybe if you have more examples, you can share from other projects. So, eh? I will complement it then. Yes. <laughs> so for example, if I, I, I didn't participate in projects, I will explain. So, <laughs> so if in the 5G city, so they, they had like this multi-layer orchestrator. So these were from a deliverable of an actual European project that is terminated. So it was an actual solution that they used for the pilots, their demos, etc. So they, they had like OSM for the global orchestrator of their whole network. And then here they make a specific adaptation of this Fog OS that is a, a Mac, real, Mac compliant orchestrator to manage the edge. And they had some interface connecting these two because of course the global orchestrator must talk to the local one, but maybe all the, the decisions regarding how to manage the computation and communication resources of the edge are taken locally. So they have this multi-tier solution. Another project, the 5G Carmen, that was more uh, oriented to uh, connected cars and uh, automatic uh, maneuvers of driving cars, had a different approach. So they have here, okay, different, more similar. So you had here like, um, global orchestrator again, but then at the local, uh, at the edge, you had some local instances of the same or different orchestrators. So here you had OSM and here you had like uh, two different solutions of more lightweight orchestration, some uh, reduced version of OSM or a different uh, software that were like the local orchestrators. So the global one was talking to the local orchestrator, but then to complicate things, since it was a very specific use case related to connected cars, they wanted to have some specific, to orchestrate specific services very related to their examples. So to, yes. Uh, question. Yes. So for this example, you have the global orchestrator that is mm -hmm. using the same architecture in the and support. And then the local orchestrators are using the same architecture as well, and they are connected with the graphical chain. 
So th this is like the central orchestrator, and then these are managing the, the virtual functions of the edge. So this is one edge, maybe this is another edge, because maybe you have different edge locations. So what they said here is that again, we'll try different technologies. Maybe one edge is orchestrated by this, another to, to test different technologies. Okay, um, or maybe they were different partners, make different demos and uh, make sure put them all together. But it's like this can talk to this and this can talk to this. And this handles uh, how the virtual functions are deployed and how they're managed at each edge. But on top of that, they had an orchestration. Hmm? This is like a central. And this is edge. This is one edge location. This is another edge location. What, what is the... Yeah, uh, my question was because you just explained the, the edge of the state and trying to make it the state of. So this is implemented into the server really. So did you do the net, network visualization and you have the edge of them? But for example, for the hospital application, you say that we can implement that in the, in the hospital. And then at some point, uh, what happened if I need to put just small servers like for uh, push the edge more. Like, so, 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 I, I'm not sure I understand yeah. completely, but this would be like, okay, you're in a hospital or something. Okay. So you, you have like your 5G network and the edge and everything. So you have a lot of virtual functions. You have, have virtual functions for the RAM, for the core. You have the applications, etc. You have a lot of virtual functions. So the orchestrator here, like, sees everything, sees all, all the available resources and makes like the global orchestration. But then says, for example, I, want, I have this local edge server that is in specific hospital wing or so I want. So in this hospital server, I want to run some specific functions of the network. I want to have the run uh, functions. I want to have uh, some services, uh, some applications for the users that are connected there, etc. So. So this orchestrator said, okay, the run functions will run to the edge. Okay, I will talk to this guy here that is this runs at this edge. So, okay, so deploy me, uh, handle all uh, run functions, applications, etc., that are at your edge. So, so this will like micromanage and optimize the orchestration of these local resources, but then report to the, the big one here. And this makes sense, for example, if you want to migrate a service, you run something here, but then you want to, to pass the service to a different Mac, you probably go like that. Yeah. You talk to the, the boss. Thank you. So it's something like that. But then they also had an additional orchestration component because th this here orchestrated the, the deployment of the virtual network functions. Okay, I will launch this virtual network function here. But then they wanted to optimize the services that, you, that offered to the connected cars that were not relevant to the network. They were relevant to specific applications for the connected cars. So they implemented a custom piece of software. I think it was in Python or I don't know what, that had very specific services for the car. So this was like an extra orchestrator that only handled these services. So it would talk with these local guys, but it was like a micromanagement only of the applications because they had like an automotive example and they wanted to, to have a customized solution to handle this. So as you see, the implementation is, yes. So just to go back to the question we discussed, so a, a user cannot access the boss directly, so with the old look of the button, and so, so maybe they start at one and they end up at the other. Yes, but you as a user, you don't know. I mean, this is the, the, the operator's perspective that orchestrates this. You as a user, you are a connected car. So you, you, you connect to your base station and you want a specific service. So the network will know, okay, you are connected to this base station. The Mac is collocated to this base station or the same. So you are served by this one, but the car is moving. And we detected that now you go closer to another access point. So this will have to talk to this, we have to talk to others. So we want to launch the same application in the other edge location because we want you to have a continuity of service. 
So in the background, to, to do all this, you need to have this connection between the different orchestrators. And there is not one solution to do it. So, yes. The global orchestrator uh, managed the land resources and also the computing resources at the end. This is also fun, uh, considered energy for the land resources and computing resources. Then, the, the rules that you have for the orchestration, you can implement and the part of the research projects usually because this gives you the these are the software this software running as orchestrator give you the, the the capability of allocating resources okay reserve resources to launch this but the intelligence behind the behind this is something that you can produce so you can have like an intelligent module that takes the decisions based on energy requirements on the available resources etc and the orchestrator will implement this decision. But the intelligence, okay, probably all this software has some basic intelligence, maybe load balancing and functionalities like that. But then if you want to have a more intelligent allocation, and that's what all the papers with the intelligent joint orchestration, et cetera, this will be like the set of rules that you implement and you have to somehow connect to, to the actual technology that implements the solution. But yes, there is a lot of research and also A-based orchestration because you can put some rules, but then you can have it like fully automated. So based on the patterns that are observed of the traffic, of the energy requirements, et cetera, you can have like a machine learning based solution that enforces the best policy. So it's, yes. There was a there is a lot of interest in automotive. So MEC has specific effort for the automotive services because they need and I think it might, I don't know now about the, this white paper. You can check it. I don't know if it, it reads any conclusion, but edge computing is very useful whenever you have real time services. Basically. I don't know if you have any wisdom to share with us because I'm running out of. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, why is that? Why is it not me? But. Uh... <laughs> would say that, I mean, I completely agree with the fact that edge computing is really helpful when you have uh, real-time constraints or other constraints because you want to run your computation down to the edge. When you are more relaxed, then maybe it's not so needed mm -hmm. to have such computation there, mm -hmm. so maybe you can rely on the cloud. Yeah, and the but other thing... In, in, in this project, what we are also studying is the fact that maybe for an energy consumption perspective, Maybe it could be also important not to be uh, so reliable, not rely so much on, on the cloud. Maybe mm -hmm. distributing the process is also helping in reducing yes. the energy consumption. In so theory, not, edge uh, computing is more energy efficient. Yeah. And also the, the transmission of a lot of data to the cloud consumes a lot of energy. So maybe in, in addition to real-time services, when you have a lot of data, if you have a lot of sensors that generate a lot of data, it makes sense to process them at the edge and then only send to the cloud the, the meaningful part. So then you save all this transport, the, the consumption of this front hole and back hole and transport network. Yeah. And so I would say from security and privacy perspective, maybe edge computing is better than cloud because yeah. normally the, the edge infrastructure is known by the the same operator or a call as you mm -hmm. want, and it's not relying on third party like Google or whatever. So maybe you are not, uh, I mean, you don't need not to, to have any mm -hmm. privacy breach yes. like that. No? I, I can give you an example of the use cases we are dealing in now in the projects I'm, I'm involved in BSC. I had some, pre I, I think we just um, finished. So. We can, have want, we can go through this. Uh, no, no, it's a lot, but I, I will show you an example. Okay, I'll skip the 100 slides because we don't have time, but I can share with you. Yeah, 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 yeah please. Yeah. 
Okay, let's meet and kind of know them. Yes, okay, always you, you, <laughs> next time. <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll only see. <laughs> uh, so I will just show you uh, an application we are running, we are developing in our project that it, it has to do with monitoring and intersection in a smart city. So we have cameras installed on the street. We do uh, object detection, tracking, etc., in real time, and then uh, we determine the risk events. So the type of events we detect. Let's see if that makes work. So you have this guy there walking and crossing the the tram intersection. In, uh, in fact, this is in Florence because I think there are some Italian guys here. So <laughs> <laughs> no, so so this is in. Um, in, in Florence, in the Resistenza tram stop. So yeah. this guy here is, is crossing this, the tracks where it's not allowed, and the, the tram is approaching. So here we had information from the tram that was transmitted. The ILT, we didn't have 5G in this project. So we had information from the tram that it's approaching. And from the cameras, we were detecting, we have detected that, that is a pedestrian that crosses this area that we mark this area with a semantic mapping. And we said, if an object of type pedestrian is detected on this specific area, you have a pedestrian on the tracks. And if the tram is approaching, it's even more critical situation. So when we got this event, we generated an alert that was communicated forever. So this kind of processing has to be in real time. And of course, processing video, okay, there are a lot of object detection algorithms, et cetera, but doing this in real time, you don't have a lot of time. So this was one of the examples. And then the other one. Did he die? They're Italians, they survived. I mean, Italians <laughs> are, are experts in crossing. So we have the, the killer grandparent here. So, so this guy was like, <laughs> and he crossed. Uh, now this is another uh, location, another intersection when we had information from the traffic light. So the, the city of Florence provided us information from a traffic controller. So we knew the status of this traffic light here. I think it is G5, it was red. <laughs> so this guy was crossing from the crossing that is okay, but when the traffic light is red, and if you see the rest of the video, this truck. <laughs> so so this, these videos were, I mean, we had like um, some hours of recording to apply our analytics to test, and these were random incidents that we recorded because we also generate some incidents that we almost kill ourselves to, to, to capture. But these were like random events. We also had a, an old, an elder woman with like three, four bags from the shopping that was crossing like that and crossed from the middle of the street and, and practically crossed the street vertically. Like, <laughs> but she was okay. So, so this type of applications are distributed because, okay, here we have one camera, but in our deployment, we have more than one cameras in the same intersection from different angles. And we want to process it in real time, combine all this information and generate the alerts in real time. So for this, it makes sense to have its computing. And even though we have the video here that we shouldn't show these videos because they are, they are recordings from civilians, if we ever deployed this in a smart city, the videos needn't needn't be uh, don't need to be recorded you process them online you generate the alerts but these videos don't have to go to the cloud you can have in the cloud the uh, because and then you have anonymized data because when we detect a pedestrian we just record that uh, object type uh, per pedestrian in this position but we don't keep their face or so it's anonymized data and this data can go to the cloud but not the actual video now we have it because we were debugging, but we want to show the example. But in a real city, you would have this privacy requirement met by the fact that these videos not are live streamed, but you don't need to to share them, to put them on the cloud. To just thinking about the here, uh, video is the first one So I just want to compare with autonomous cars. Have lots of sensors and you might have lots of cars. So it's, I'm, I'm, it's not sure uh, which is more than the The thing with autonomous cars is that you have a lot of computation taking part in the car. 
So I think that all this uh, automatic uh, driving and stuff that you have cameras in the car and goes, we didn't have time to discuss it, but this computation usually happens, the, the, the actual car, uh, car has uh, computing resources, you have GPUs or whatever. So we've, we've also had a project that I was not involved that you had an actual GPU. So we had, let's see, we have this, this kind of devices, uh, small embedded devices that are GPU enabled. So you put this in a car and all the sensors that are coming from the car are processed there. So it's like, This. So it was this example. So you have like this software infrastructure within the car. So everything is processed there. So you don't have network actually. Everything is within the same device. So this, you have like time guarantees that everything will work on the time that is needed. So, so these are like closed loop systems that you have in automated driving, you have in robotic uh, application. So when you need 100% time guarantees, <laughs> you cannot involve the network. Even though 5G and 6G do miracles, when it's really you driving, you you put everything in connected. But then you can have assisting functions that can run to the edge. So it was like the example we saw in the city, we, we can have a distributed architecture and you could send messages to the car for example, in real time that could assist, but you cannot do the object detection of the car on the edge and then send it back. I think it's too risky because if something, if you have interference, the car will crash. So, yes. Uh, how long it took, or, uh, or the, uh, what the, the, the action? We, get the incident that might happen, then, uh, we, we send alerts. That. We send alerts to, for example, we have some connected trams and some connected cars. So the idea was, okay, to send to the connected cars, uh, careful, a pedestrian is crossing with red in front of you. Or to the tram operator, uh, careful, a pedestrian is crossing. So. Um, Hmm? I mean, this application doesn't exist right now. Yes, well, it was a pilot that we made. So we sent an actual message. We, we generated a message and we had a, a V2X uh, router that's like Wi Fi. And we could receive in our mobile phone, we could receive this alert. But it was like a pilot. So it's not. But you could make it more reliable and stable and have a product that does this. And... Yes. In our example, because in, in, in my group, we are interested in distributed computing. So in our, I don't know if I have, to, I, I think I don't have it here, but uh, in our example, it was collocated with the cameras. So we have, let me see, maybe this. So we, this was like an intersection and the tram was passing in, in the center. This was one of the locations. So we, we just had two cameras. So we covered like one small, I, I think I need to see one, we, we covered this part and this part of, of the street. If you had 10 cameras, we would cover everything. So we covered just two parts of this intersection. So we put two cameras and next to the cameras, we put these um, NVIDIA devices. And then we had a third device that was because here there were some cabinets. So in the end, we have like two cameras and three edge computing devices interconnected. We didn't have the Mac, we don't have an edge platform. We have different pieces of software. <laughs> so, so what we did is we, we got the videos from the two cameras and these two videos were processed in the three devices because we have a distributed framework. So we had three computing devices for two cameras and we distributed the computation of this 
And then in the end, we had a V2X server that, that sent the alarms. Also had input from the traffic light controller. We had input from the tram through LTE. So we're like a fusion of different inputs in real time with a lot of problems and generated the alert. So this was like a use case scenario. Yes. No, we did this manually. So, so we 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 installed we we selected where to install the cameras within the project. Okay? We want to cover this crossing and this intersection, the, this specific part. So then we have like a, a stable image. So then you annotate. You can in the end you you define pixel areas of of interest so like semantic annotation say so this is like the crossing this is the tracks this is the street and then you define events you say if pedestrian is crossing outside the, the the pedestrian crossing it's one type of event if they cross the tracks it's a different event if the red the, they cross the crossing but the traffic light is red so it's like a set of rules these scenarios we develop with the help of other partners from the city and from the tram network. So they said, we want to see this type of crossings. Or in, so it's like the, the so you use. Receive some information from the traffic light to see if it is. We received, in, in this case, we had the, a traffic light car. controller that sent us messages about the traffic light change. But in practice, this sometimes has delays. So it has some milliseconds of delay. So when you we have the camera, so the traffic light in, in real life was, uh, it turned from red to green, but it take uh, some milliseconds of delay. So for some milliseconds, the cards were noted starting, but our information was that the traffic light was red. So we issued like 100 alarms, the cars are crossing in red, but it was like these milliseconds of transition. So you have a lot of problems like that. But in stable operation, it was very cool because you could get the information from, from the traffic lights. You can also detect it. I mean, there are, we used YOLO for the detection. I don't know if you know it. And you can also have YOLO trained to detect the traffic light status, if it's red or green. But then you need to have a good view. So with one camera, you cannot get everything. So I don't think any more questions. I think that's all. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>